Well, it's uh, now my pleasure to introduce uh, and Professor uh, Ulrich Novic. Uh, he's a professor of dermatology and the founder of the Psoriasis Center in the Department of Dermatology at the University Medical Center, Schleswig Holstein, uh, Campus Kiel, Germany. Uh, the Psoriasis Center provides a large clinical trial unit and is part of the Comprehensive Center for Inflammation Medicine at the Kiel Campus. Professor Novic, uh, 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 the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luis. And um, I have um, a limited time now to uh, jump into my topic, vaccination, immune responses in patients with psoriasis, what we know and what we need to investigate. And we've already heard from Satvir uh, how important some magic words are. And the most important magic word, at least in the beginning and now with a new chapter opening about vaccination is the gap of data. And um, of course, it takes a while to get data when a pandemic starts, when you have a vaccine ready uh, to be used in a large population, it will of course take a lot of time to analyze vaccination responses and to see if in diseases such as psoriasis, vaccination responses are as in normal population-based environments and whether uh, diseases are not only uh, as such, but also treated um, will affect vaccination responses. And this is uh, the res um, that was uh, the topic given to me. And um, after showing my disclosures, um, I think the most important questions we have at the moment um, are, are psoriasis patients more susceptible for infections such as SARS-CoV-2? And we heard that this may not really differ from the general population, except for severe forms of psoriasis. And therefore, in the beginning, we all try to um, <clears throat> avoid panic among our patients. And the most important um, issue of panic is to stop all treatments. And that uh, our advice at this time was to continue with the treatment and contact your, uh, or the dermatologist or the people in charge of the treatment. And I think what we did at this time with a very, very uh, low database was uh, well taken. And um, the data that we have just shown from so to that pro from so protect and from other registries, I think, um, showed us that we um, um, did, our, did a, did a recommendation to our patients that was uh, right at this time and in the retrospect. The second question I think is important is psoriasis, a risk factor for severe causes of COVID-19. And we learned that um, it's not psoriasis as such, but it's mainly comorbidity that goes along with psoriasis. And, uh, obesity was just mentioned, and we've seen data uh, that, for example, hypertension and other uh, comorbid conditions are more of a risk factor than psoriasis itself. And I think these kind of questions can be um, answered by data very soon and in a more comprehensive way as we could do this in the past. And now um, I already alluded to, we have now opened a second chapter of uh, dealing with a pandemic, and this is to offer a vaccination uh, to patients and people. And um, there are, again, some important questions to be answered. And the first is, um, do vaccinations induce a protective response in psoriasis patients in this time? The second is, do medications for psoriasis interfere with vaccination responses? We just heard from first data from uh, the vaccination study within SoProtect that obviously methotrexate is um, a possible candidate for such an interference with vaccination responses, which was also shown not only for SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations, but for other vaccinations that have been investigated in the past. And I think there's also a third question that needs to be answered, and this is, do vaccines cause flares of psoriasis? And when I, oh no, when we look into uh, the Medline database, for example, there are more and more cases uh, uh, popping up showing that indeed, um, particularly with follow-up vaccinations, there is a maybe increased risk for flares of psoriasis. And I will try to give you some of the data that have been published to answer the questions I have raised. We've just seen these um, infograms, infographics. They're very helpful, as Hathwe was already alluding to. And I think the most important and positive um, outcome of, of this is that 93% of our psoriasis patients showed full recovery from COVID-19. And I think this is also something 
that needs to be communicated <clears throat> because as you've seen, there's a low proportion of um, hesitant behavior regarding vaccination. But of course, also there is a hesitation to see doctors in the offices or in the or, or in ambulances in the clinic because of a potential risk of getting infected from others. So this is something we need to communicate. Um, regarding uh, the burden uh, COVID-19 uh, brought to the people, um, you've already noted um, psoriasis worsens by 43% of the patients that reported to the um, so protect data registry. This is quite an amazing amount. And we've just learned that there may be some aspects of a psychological background, such as fear, worries, particularly in females that are more prone to these kind of um, threats um, during a pandemic or uh, something that that brings a potential threat to communities. So that's also something we need to know to better educate and advise our patients and the patient's environment slash families and partners, um, but also the treating physicians about these um, issues. Well, I will jump now into um, this um, data we have generated, never published. And um, I think it's very important not only to keep an eye on what happens after the first dose and what happens about the effect of a vaccination against infections, but also about in, in a vaccination response regarding protection of the disease. So this is data published very recently, um, and that is um, regarding estimated vaccine effectiveness of RNA-based uh, vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 infection. And um, here it's shown that after the first dose, we have a protection level um, vaccine effectiveness level of about 55% after the first dose, measured of 14 days and beyond after the first dose. Um, after the second dose, this level was raised to 48. And after the third dose, the level is up to 69. So that's always what we can call full protection for SARS-CoV-2 infection. So the second important aspect is, does this also protect for severe outcomes? And so severe outcomes of COVID-19 disease. And here in the same publication, we have data after first and second dose. And again, it's um, displayed as adjusted vaccine effectiveness. And there's again, um, clear evidence that the first dose offers some degree of protection, in this case, 72 in this particular um, publication. But after the second dose, this is really lifted up to 92, meaning virtually full protection against severe outcomes of COVID-19. And it little bit corresponds to this 93% um, full recovery after uh, COVID-19 in the so protect. So I think that's very good news for those uh, who emphasize um, vaccinations, and um, of course, that's what we all do. Um, there is an interesting Hungarian study that was also published quite recently in a small cohort, 102, 102 patients moderate to, se uh, to severe psoriasis, and in, in addition, 55 matched uh, controls, um, and that's during biologic therapy. And they all received a, um, an mRNA-based vaccine and data were taken um, about 10 to 21 days after the vaccination. So um, they looked into two uh, different uh, categories. First of all, uh, serology, but also um, uh, a little bit more differentiated. And I highlighted here uh, the line with the IgE serum levels. And what you can see here is, um, if, you if you look into the whole study population, that there is um, a vaccine response for sure, increasing the IgE against um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. But there is a differentiation in the drug classes. And we have here the biologic drug class, and you see that the lowest le uh, serum level is um, during um, anti-TNF inhibitor treatment, uh, then followed by the IL-23, uh, sorry, the IL-17 and IL-23 uh, drug class, and the last one is for ostekinoma. Um, and there is a shift in the level of uh, serum IgEs, and it's highest for um, ostekinoma-treated patients. 
And quite interestingly, this is a bit backed up by a, um, another uh, study in a um, even smaller cohort that have looked into the stab stability of the vaccination response. And it was shown that those patients that <clears throat> were receiving uh, TNF blockers had the lowest stability of the vaccination response um, in comparison to healthy controls. And these patients were patients with chronic inflammatory diseases from um, our Kiel um, um, Comprehensive Center for Inflammation Medicine. So these included uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatological disorders, but also psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And the data were taken after a second vaccination with the BioNTech vaccine. So there is some evidence that some groups of, of uh, treatments such as TNF antagonists, but also we've heard about uh, methotrexate may affect vaccination um, strategies and vaccine, vaccine response stability. Um, the vaccination events, and I alluded to this with one of my questions, may not only be beneficial in inducing a um, response that is protective against infection and disease, but may also uh, bring along some side effects. And that's um, a recently published study from uh, a Greek center of the um, Isle of Crete. And um, it's a re retrospective study um, reporting uh, 12 psoriasis patients with cutaneous side effects after a second dose of uh, the BioNTech vaccine or the AstraZeneca. And the group includes um, nine males and three, uh, nine females and three males. The mean age were 40, around 44, 43. Um, but the quite long duration of psoriasis. And there's a very short latency between dose and event after the second dose of the vaccines, 13 days only. And the main duration of the exacerbation was, 20, was two and a half months. Um, six of the 12 patients were on biologic monotherapy. And here um, is the list of the, um, the cutaneous side effects uh, that were observed in the study. And 10 of the 12 patients showed an exacerbation of their plaque psoriasis. Um, what is remarkable is that in two patients, there was a pustular flare. And that's more and more now in the form of case reports in the medical databases that psoriasis patients may respond to second, third, and fourth vaccines with a pustular flare. And we, we have, there's still a, a tremendous data gap. One patient, interestingly enough, not only showed a exacerbation of plaque psoriasis, but also um, got a bolus pemphigoid. Whether or not this is really vaccine response related or by coincidence, of course, we don't know. This is a study, um, again, from our center um, in Kiel, where we studied uh, 26 patients with um, IMIT including, uh, as I said, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatological disorders, but also uh, patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And this was after a first vaccination and a second vaccination of uh, the BioNTech uh, vac vaccine. And this is now a discrimination in IgE, IgA, and neutralizing antibody responses. <clears throat> and in principle, what you can see from the three figures is that in, in the general uh, um, disease population of the image that was analyzed here, vaccination responses are uh, quite well and showing an increase of the levels of um, antibodies that are, that are generated after vaccination. Whether this is IgG or IgA, or whether these antibodies are neutralized. However, there are some single patients depicted down here but also here and there, uh, where vaccination uh, responses are insufficient. And we still don't know if those patients show a common pattern, if this, these patients have been treated with special uh, treatments, including systemic steroids or a combination treatment, for example, steroids plus, plus either thioprin and others, um, where we could, um, uh, in the end, find a profile where uh, the, the um, follow-up investigation um, about the vaccination response is somewhat mandatory 
and we cannot predict that those patients will receive um, um, effective vaccination response. So that in the end brings me to um, the formulation of my future needs. I think what is, um, imp what is really needed is that uh, longitudinal studies are implemented <clears throat> regarding the longevity of vaccination responses. We should not forget that um, all the vaccines uh, that we have um, until today, mainly the BioNTech one and AstraZeneca and, and others, Moderna, they have been, um, have been generated against the Wuhan virus, virus structure. And now we face the situation that with the Omicron variant, even though uh, patients are four times vaccinated with these kind of vaccines, uh, can be infected by SARS-CoV-2 with the Omicron variant and even get a mostly a mild cause of COVID-19. So we need to shape our longitudinal studies a bit along the vaccination strategies we were using so far. And of course, we need a better risk assessment of treatments um, regarding the level of protection against the infection and the disease and um, in comparison to a no treatment strategy. And <clears throat> registries such as SoProtect, but also others and, and Germany have the uh, Corona Best registry um, should be aligned with each other to, to get a large database soon to give better answers to those uh, future needs questions. With this, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take on to take questions. Thank you. Excellent talk. Uh, just uh, one, one question. Uh, based on your uh, education and your clinical experience, is there evidence that uh, some uh, clinical factors, for instance, age and consequent immunosenescence might modify the risk of on one hand depressed immunogenicity following vaccinations or on the other perhaps a modified risk of uh, exacerbations following vaccination? Um, Luis, this is a very good question, and I have no answer to both. Um, we have seen um, also from Satvir's talk that, for example, uh, being of a male uh, gender um, and, and having more severe disease, being non-white ethnic, having comorbid conditions, uh, these are the, 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 the patients that are more prone to infections and COVID, but these are also the patients that are more difficult to treat. So that is our our difficult patient population. Uh, we have no predictors so far, and we have we neither have predictors of, of vaccination responses. Um, this is something we, where we need big data for. And um, you know that a drug such as rituximab is the only one from which is clearly known that there is a significant impairment of vaccination responses. And we have some evidence for methotrexate, as it was shown during this meeting, um, we have some evidence for anti-DNFs, as I have alluded to with my uh, data uh, slides from very recent um, 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 investigations, and we need to back up those with better data, with more data uh, from different countries, from different ethnic groups, um, and um, and then we have to constantly modify our recommendations that we bring out to the. Uh, uh, physicians community, dermatology community, how to uh, counsel uh, their psoriasis patients. Thank you very much. I uh, really enjoyed uh, this uh, this talk, all the talks of the webinar, and it's uh, now time to uh, thank you all, uh, the presenters, the attendees, the IPC, and our sponsors, and invite you to keep tuned for the next uh, webinars in the International Psoriasis Council series. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.